notice the title and the author. You can see that more clearly on this slide I've made for you here, where you have what we call in the museum business, the tombstone information. That's something that's part of your capstone project, knowing that, where you get the, the name of the person who make, made it. That's usually the first thing, the title of the artwork. Here, the full title is actually in italics. That's what you normally do with titles of artworks. The reason Lady Fang and the Bear is not in italics is because that refers to what's happening in this scene, which is part of a bigger whole. The entire work, that bigger whole, is called Admonitions of the Imperial Instructress to the Court Ladies. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Admonitions means authoritative advice or warning. So it's sort of the Imperial Instructress, it's her job to scold and advise the court lady. So we'll talk about those admonitions in relationship to kind of Confucianist meanings of what's happening in the painting. But let's go back to the facts of the painting. The fact of the author, we notice it's follower of Gu Kaiji. Scholars debate whether the illustrious art, artist Gu Kaiji, whose name has been recorded in the Chinese art historical literature, whether in fact he created this painting or a follower of his did. Either way, it's a splendid and magnificent painting. And in fact, we will be learning that in China, the, tr the idea is that you can learn by closely studying a master. So if this was a follower, we can assume that this follower was doing all in his, because they're mostly his, power to actually recreate fully and exactly what Gu Keiji had completed. One more quick po point about the tombstone. This is a hand scroll. There are two main formats for painting in China. The hand scroll, which has a horizontal orientation and unrolls laterally. And the hanging scroll, which has a vertical orientation and can be viewed all at once. The important thing that we'll talk about is the hand scroll unfolds so that you see it slowly as a, something that you discover over time. You don't see it all at once. In either case, as in the case of this painting, you, paintings like this were generally made out of ink and colors on silk. If you go to the website of the British Museum, which owns this magnificent hand scroll, you can get a better sense of its broad horizontal sweep of what it actually means that it is nine inches high by 11 feet long as the textbook indicates and also what it means that it has additional components added later this is an a beautiful feature of painting as we will see in china is that the painting won't be an object that stands alone but it will actually be it will be responded to through later calligraphy and later paintings so that it becomes part of a kind of a timeline of call and response across the centuries. And this makes it incredibly difficult to photograph. I mean, <laughs> you know, the poor British Museum, what are they to do? They want to show you an overview photograph here, but you can barely see it because there are multiple components. So they have these lower parts that you can focus in and see some of the added calligraphy, which includes sketches and other beautiful paintings that I'll show you in a minute. And then you can zoom in to see some of the main scenes, such as the one presented in your textbook. And then you can see others. It's taking a while to load. Hmm. You also get a sense of the, the just amazing flow of space with such a long scroll, when you see it on display here at the British Museum in this photograph, which is from an article in the Global Times, 
Um, interestingly, it could only be displayed for six weeks at a time and under these light conditions where it's in a very dark room because light is damaging to fibers and papers. So let's move now to subject matter. What is being shown? What is being depicted and why for the original audience? So your textbook authors, Stocks and Cothran, give you one particularly wonderful scene, one segment from the larger scroll in which we have Lady Fang and there's an escaped circus bear that's rushing toward her husband who is right here and she as they say calmly rushes to place herself between the beast and the emperor this is very much about the behavior that is appropriate for a confucianist wife in the imperial court so confucianism is a system that's in the imperial government now and her behavior has consequences in terms of the proper ordering of relationships. So we actually see, we see these two ladies of the court who are concubines. She's one of the concubines. Lady Feng is one of the concubines of the emperor. Those concubines are just fleeing. <laughs> They're getting out of there while this crazy looking bear comes, but not Lady Feng because what she's displaying is her willingness to sacrifice herself for the greater good, the emperor, her, her duty and her loyalty. So if we think back to what we learned about Confucianism, right? A Junji is always in Confucius's sayings referred to, referring to a male, since this is a highly male dominated society, society and women are treated as inferior. So they are not the ones who are held to be the models of a culted individual, but they are expected to nevertheless display that capacity in the service of their relationships to the family and to the male-centered order. So this is definitely an example of filial duty, not so much parent to child, but wife to husband. In fact, Lady Fang is showing numerous Confucian ideals that I'm listing here, right? So there's definitely human heartedness. Certainly Li, she is doing the appropriate action for the moment. She knows how to behave and certainly bravery, right? Maybe not forgiveness, but maybe she's, you know, forgiving the other co concubines for just getting out of there and not helping her.